Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining the TCTAP 2022, uh, the virtual meeting. And this session is a one of the highlight session is hot debate 2022 and the chest pain evaluation and the new chest pain guideline and its implication. So I'm going to introduce co-moderator Dr. Deepak Bhatt uh, from Boston and I'm D.W. Park from Assam Medical Center. I'm going to introduce the, and the world renowned the panel uh, in this session and the Dr. Michael Gibson from Boston, Dr. Ellen Jeremias from New York and the Dr. David Kanjari and the Dr. Jungmin An and Dr. Do Yun An from Assam Medical Center. And the first speech in the I'll introduce and co-moderator Dr. Deepak Bhatt and the Brigham Women's uh, Hospital in the United States and the moderator industry keynote. Dr. Deepak. Uh, so I'm just going to start off with a keynote and then we'll get started with this symposium which is on the chest pain guideline that just came out from the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. Before getting started, these are my disclosures, which include several relationships with various drug and device companies. And I may be discussing off-label and investigational uses of drugs and devices during my talk or the subsequent Q&A. So I think these chest pain guidelines that just came out are really useful to practicing physicians they start off with the basics, that is a history and a physical, and the importance of eliciting symptoms. And uh, of course, in people that have chest pain, there can be a lot of confusing symptoms. Uh, there used to be that thought of atypical sort of chest pain, but that's something the current version of the guidelines really discourages and prefers calling that non-cardiac chest pain. Beyond the history and physical, of course, the ECG or electrocardiogram remains an important part of triaging patients with chest pain, whether they're patients presenting for the first time in the office or the emergency department. An ECG is an important quick way to make sure that, first of all, they're not having an ST segment elevation MI. And if they are, well, then they have to go down a particular algorithm of STEMI care with hopefully primary PCI, but if it's a part of the world where that's not possible, uh, then prompt fibrinolytic therapy followed by timely transfer to a place that can do PCI. And beyond STEMI, there's also the possibility of NSTEMI. Sometimes there are electrocardiographic changes. Sometimes there aren't electrocardiographic changes. Uh, there can be biomarkers that are positive, denoting NSTEMI, or if biomarkers are positive, then unstable angina can be diagnosed. With high sensitivity troponins, which really should be the standard of care these days, and increasingly that is the standard throughout most of the world, unstable angina is becoming less frequent, but registries show that it is still there. And those patients who are high risk, either with NSTEMI or unstable angina, really ought to go on to the cath lab. Though those who are lower risk may go on to a non-invasive evaluation, including things such as stress testing or computed tomography and geography. CT angio. Speaking of CT angio, beyond a role in low-risk ACS, it also has a role, an emerging role, I would say, in stable chest pain. And data that have compared coronary CT angio to functional testing, that is stress testing, it's been kind of interesting. If one looks at meta-analyses of the randomized clinical trials registry data, there are lower associated rates of myocardial infarction and higher rates of use of preventive therapy in patients that are getting coronary CTO, CTA versus stress testing. So potentially some benefits of a strategy of seeing the anatomy, both for the physician seeing the anatomy, but also perhaps the patient seeing the anatomy. Also an increase in coronary revascularizations. I suppose one can argue whether that's good or bad. Does that have any role in the reduction in MI? Is the reduction in MI all due to an increase in preventive therapy? Well, lots of debate one can have about all that. As far as which imaging modality to pick, well, that too depends on the patient. Sometimes anatomical information, such as a CT angio, would be most useful. Sometimes functional testing. Does the patient actually have the symptoms they're complaining about when you put them on the treadmill and exercise them? That can be very useful diagnostically as well. So you have to really calibrate the test for what you're trying to accomplish. And the guidelines, I believe, do a very good job with respect to this latter aspect. That is, in asymptomatic patients, basically these chest pain guidelines are saying, don't test. Really, that's a waste of time, energy, money. Uh, in patients that are lower risk, well, there, again, in general, no testing would be uh, recommended, but then you might do things like an ECG or a CAC scan, I suppose. 
In patients that are intermediate risk, if they're being evaluated for acute chest pain, uh, there it makes sense to do some sort of anatomic or functional testing. And for those uh, that are intermediate or high risk, again, anatomic or functional testing may be useful if they have stable chest pain. If they're high risk in a emergency department setting, well, there they should just undergo invasive coronary angiography. Surely patients that have ACS in general should undergo invasive coronary angiography uh, unless they're different mitigating factors, if they've got lots of comorbidities and so forth, uh, maybe not appropriate, but in general, that would be the pathway. So this is a very quick summary of what the chest pain guidelines tell us to do for stable and unstable chest pain. Now, there are many causes of acute coronary syndrome. Plaque rupture is the most common. Plaque erosion is increasingly being recognized, especially in younger patients and female patients. Calcified nodules, also a cause of ACS. Other causes include coronary spasms, spontaneous coronary artery dissection or SCAD, embolism, say from atrial fibrillation or left ventricular thrombus. Uh, and this category of MI with non-obstructive coronary arteries or so-called Minoka has really come to its own, to the forefront, accounting for about five to 6% of cases of acute coronary syndromes and even larger percentage in younger patients. So. Uh, lots that's going on in terms of ACS. It remains a very dynamic field in terms of our understanding of what causes ACS and perhaps in the future, how to refine our treatment algorithms to be even more precise. Uh, other things that have come up in the world of ACS and, and STEMI to an extent, and STEMI as well, uh, are these patients without Smurfs? Are they real? Well, I think they're real. And if you haven't heard of Smurfs, uh, they refer to standard modifiable cardiovascular risk factors and some patients appear not to have them. Uh, in part, that could be under diagnosis and under treatment of conventional risk factors. That is a 40-year-old that does actually have hypercholesterolemia but hasn't been treated for it because they are young. So some of it is just under treatment. But some of it appears to be that they really don't have conventional risk factors. And maybe that's things like inflammation or LP little a or risk factors yet to be uh, diagnosed and uh, potentially then service therapeutic target. So uh, this concept of patients without Smurfs is another one that has uh, relatively recently entered the medical literature. Aside from ACS, when one is talking now about chronic stable angina, there the role of invasive coronary angiography is a little less urgent. Uh, there you want to really try medical therapy, non-invasive risk stratification, and for patients that have symptoms that are refractory or progression of symptoms on medical therapy, there remains an important role of invasive coronary angiography. As well, when in the cath lab, technologies such as fractional flow reserve or FFR can be extremely useful to figure out whether a angiographically moderate or even severe appearing lesion is in fact impairing flow. And some of the challenges with FFR is if there are things like tandem lesions, the math, the uh, calculations can get a little bit tricky. And in some respects there, Techniques such as IFR can be a bit more useful. And incorporating techniques such as IFR into the invasive angiographic assessment of patients can more carefully refine our treatment approaches uh, when coupled with proceeding non-invasive therapy as a gatekeeper. I would say that the evolution of PCI, in particular second-generation drug-eluting stents, has changed the risk-benefit calculus of PCI quite dramatically by concomitant reductions in stent restenosis and stent thrombosis, second-generation drug-eluting stents at least have the potential to reduce the risk of MI and CV death compared with older PCI techniques, say bare metal stenting or plain old balloon angioplasty. Bit of a theoretical construct, but certainly it does appear that outcomes are improving with PCI rates of stent thrombosis dropping pretty dramatically. The timing of potential PCI is another consideration, obviously in STEMI, if you can, you want to do it right away. In NSTEMI or high-risk unstable angina, probably still benefit going sooner, uh, say within 24 hours being ideal, especially if patients are very high risk, but uh, almost always, I would say within 24 to 48 hours, if possible. For stable angina, on the other hand, there, there's less urgency in terms of time. In fact, there, really want to maximize medical therapy and see if there are still persistent symptoms before proceeding to the cath lab. Beyond PCI, there's a role for cabbage that remains even in 2022. 
especially for patients with diabetes, complex multivessel coronary artery disease, their cabbage has an incredibly important role. And factors that favor cabbage include the fact that if a patient has high lesion complexity, they're much more likely to uh, not need repeat procedures if they undergo cabbage as the initial procedure versus PCI. And if the goal was to relieve angina, in general, there's a lower burden of residual angina with complete revascularization that cabbage more often affords. On the other hand, if there are factors such as a high stroke risk, advanced age, patients that just don't want to be in the hospital, avoid complications like arrhythmia and bleeding uh, and uh, wound infections and, and, and that sort of thing, well, those factors favor PCI. And in the patient, uh, in particular with diabetes uh, and multivessel disease, really do want to consider cabbage, uh, especially cabbage with the use of a left internal mammary artery graft and aiming for complete revascularization. Though, again, modern PCI techniques, drug looting, stents, adjunctive imaging have narrowed the gap, but not eliminated that gap between cabbage and PCI. As far as the chest pain guidelines, they provide excellent algorithms for the sake of time. I'm not gonna walk through this slide, but just refer you to the chest pain guideline, uh, where, for example, patients with no known coronary artery disease here are shown through an algorithm uh, that involves really the latest and greatest data. Uh, in green are the class one recommendations in yellow to A, but again, stress testing is there, coronary CT angio is there being elevated compared with years past. Uh, and of course, in the highest risk patients, invasive coronary angiography remains an important thing to do. And in patients with known coronary disease, here's the algorithm for that, same sort of color scheme. But once more, these guidelines incorporating not just stress testing, but coronary CT angio, even incorporating FFR as part of non-invasive CT angio, uh, as well as stress testing. So uh, the older modalities are there, but the newer modalities of testing are also there. The key, and what the guidelines try to emphasize, is choose the right test for the right patient. So there's a role for everything and everybody. Uh, so whatever your favorite modality is, don't feel left out. If you like exercise stress testing, well, there certainly uh, remains a role for that. If you like stress CMR, MPI, well, there's a role for that as well. So again, depending on what you're looking for, a wide variety of different tests that might be appropriate. And in terms of CT angio, stress tests uh, with imaging, uh, it's not meant to be an either or or a war. Uh, for some patients, uh, CT angio is better. For others, stress testing is better. Again, depends what the goal is, depends on the specific patient. Uh, these aren't the chest pain guidelines, but rather the REVAS guidelines that just came out from the ACC and AHA as well. Again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through everything, but mention that a big part of these guidelines are patient-centered care involving a heart team approach that includes representatives from interventional cardiology, cardiac surgery, and importantly, clinical cardiology. And that approach is often best to decide medical therapy, percutaneous therapy, or surgical therapy. And also as part of these REVAS guidelines, an emphasis on shared decision-making. What the patient thinks is really important. Now, if they're having a STEMI and cardiogenic shock, obviously go to the cath lab as soon as possible. But for stable ischemic syndromes, they're really the patient's preference can influence things and should influence things quite a bit. So to quickly summarize some of the salient points of the chest pain guidelines in this recent perspective in Jack Cardiovascular Imaging, we lay out the key points from the chest pain guidelines. They're the first US or international guideline for evaluating chest pain. They're recommendations for both acute and stable chest pain. There is an emphasis on deferring testing in low risk individuals. That happens a lot in the US, maybe less so in other parts of the world, but we waste a lot of money and energy testing people that are low risk where we know they don't have anything, but we're just testing, I think, because of medical legal reasons. Uh, there's an emphasis on contemporary models to estimate risk and pretest probability of coronary artery disease, an emphasis on more selective use of imaging, emphasis on evidence-based recommendations with increased quantity and quality versus prior guidelines, and emphasis on intensification of preventive therapies, a big role for preventive cardiology in these guidelines, and incorporation of the most contemporary imaging techniques. There are specific recommendations for the evaluation of non-obstructive coronary artery disease, an emphasis on unique aspects of evaluating women with chest pain, including microvascular disease, 
an ischemia with non-obstructive coronary artery disease. There's a movement away, as I alluded to earlier, from atypical chest pain as a descriptor, instead preferring non-cardiac chest pain. An incorporation of prior test results when deciding on patient management and the need and type of testing, including a warranty period of having a prior normal coronary CT, angio, and stress test results. Don't need to keep repeating tests every time the patient shows up uh, if there's no change really in their underlying clinical status. Factors to consider when selecting between coronary CT, angio, and stress testing, as I just showed you, uh, are also laid out in these guidelines and detailed recommendations on evaluating non-cardiac causes of chest pain. I think these are really great guidelines. This is a summary figure from the guidelines. It's color-coded. It emphasizes some of the key points uh, that chest pain can mean more than chest pain, high sensitivity troponins are preferred, encouraging patients to seek early care for acute symptoms, to have patients share in the decision-making, to defer routine testing in low-risk patients, to use clinical decision pathways to remind us that women may be more likely to present with accompanying symptoms, uh, to identify patients most likely to benefit from further testing, a reminder that non-cardiac chest pain is in, atypical is out, and finally, structured risk assessment should be used. So a variety of different things, and hopefully these colorful graphics and mnemonics in the guideline will be useful to you as you go through these chest pain guidelines. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I hope that that was a useful, uh, albeit quick review of the chest pain guidelines, but the larger context in which they evolved. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deepak, your great lecture. And uh, after uh, three consecutive lectures, we will have enough discussion time. Okay, uh, Deepak, could you introduce the second and third speaker? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, really a pleasure to move on to the next speakers, both good friends. Uh, Dr. Manesh Patel from uh, Duke University is going to speak about CT angio and its role in chest pain. In chest pain. And after that, Dr. Vamala Puli shall talk about stress testing. So it covers a lot of um, what I was alluding to very superficially, but in greater detail. Dr. Patel? Thanks, Deepak. And uh, thank you guys for the opportunity to present this. Um, I'm a little wary in trying to debate an expert like Shriek Vamalapali about this uh, topic, but let's see if I can try to make the case for CTA, as you just heard from a great guideline conversation, that there's a lot of options. And so how do you make a decision? These are my disclosures. It's important to recognize I've reserved research funding both from the NHLBI and from some of the companies involved in cardiovascular imaging. So you just heard all the guidelines. So we still have this challenge in cardiovascular practice. I'll start with the case. It's a 58-year-old lady. She has diabetes. She shops and cleans, works at a bank. She occasionally has chest ache and walking to the grocery store. She's cramping in her calves and she's sent to our clinic for cardiovascular vascular evaluation. Her pain is sort of three out of 10 when it happens. It's described as sharp with some mild pressure. It's not pleuritic. It's localized under her left breast with some radiation to her shoulder. Has occurred with housework, but occasionally at rest. Last episode was while she was watching TV. And it occurs with activity and sometimes it relieves with rest. So how do you determine a risk and identify disease? This is the most common problem in cardiovascular medicine. And now for the first time, we have guidelines, as you just heard. So the guidelines, as you just saw, give us some direction. Here is the pretest probability calculator for our patient. She has chest pain, not dyspnea. She's 50 to 58. Pretest probability somewhere around 13 to 20%. Some could argue maybe a little higher, but in that range. It's, this is an improvement. Before this, it was the diamond and forest, and it was somewhere between 10 and 90%. So we're a little bit closer to maybe getting better at discovering that. But the real question is, in a patient with intermediate pretest probability of coronary artery disease, what test should you do? And should you do any test? This paper now is several years old, but we had this question when we were in the cath lab. We started seeing a lot of patients at that time without obstructive coronary disease. And so we did the NCDR review in the United States now, four years, a 2 million patients. And we said, how many of everybody going to the cath lab in the United States has obstructive lesion? 60%. What if you said stenosis was 50% in any lesion? It was 41%. And it went from 60% down to 40% or so when you excluded everybody with known disease, everybody who was there for a non-elective reason, everybody who wasn't there just for an MI shock or a prior valve. And when you got to that, it was about 20% of patients. And out of those 20% of patients, 37 to 40% have obstructive stenosis. And 40% had less than 20% stenosis in any vessel. 
when you did a model to say what predicted it, there's the Framingham risk score, just the risk factors, then the clinical variables, you can see the C statistic going from 0.67 to 0.742. The symptoms added a little bit. If you added the stress test finding, given that it is a biased sample because people going to the cath lab probably have an abnormal stress test, it didn't seem to add much. So we concluded at that time in 2009, 2010, that the current risk stratification, including non-invasive testing used to inform coronary angiography was not sufficient. The system is broken. It didn't say we we're doing too many heart caths. Well, another way of thinking about it is we weren't very efficient. And the current system at that time was based mostly on stress testing. There wasn't as much CT, there wasn't as much FFRCT opportunities existed. It's worth thinking about the fact that whether it's stress echo, stress treadmill, stress spec, we had both high rates of false negatives and high false positives. And so, as you've just heard, you want to do stress tests or CTA to determine if the patient has atherosclerosis, if that atherosclerosis is causing symptoms, and if those symptoms are going to limit the patient's life. We now know that no matter what happens, you want to medically treat that patient, or you want to know if they have no CAD, so you might not treat the patient. And certainly, if they have atherosclerosis, you want to try to determine if you should revascularize the patient. So I come back to my question, intermediate pretest probability, what test would you do? Our kind of classic teaching of ischemia and obstruction is that you, you start to have effort, you start to have some ischemia, you get diastolic dysfunction, systolic dysfunction, dyspnea, and eventually you get some ECG abnormalities and wall motion abnormalities and a variety of tests you can do. That reduced perfusion leads to metabol metabolic abnormalities, then leading first to diastolic and then systolic dysfunction. Here's the cascade of less blood flow leading to the increased exercise load and the thought process. But don't you just want an image to see if there's atherosclerosis? Don't you just want to know if they have a blockage and if that blockage is causing a problem? And obviously, when you get good pictures, it's hard to argue if they have atherosclerosis, whether it's no disease or complex burden of disease. Now, the first thing people do when they think about stress testing or even CTA is they say, oh, how sensitive or predictive it is. Well, we can, I can show you all the sensitivity specificity data, but as I think Shriek will show you, it's very dependent on how many people actually have coronary disease. If you study a bunch of people without coronary disease, tests look really good. If you study a bunch of people with coronary disease, they look really specific. So depending on the sensitivity or specificity, you can identify that. So it's with that background that we endeavored in 2010 or so to randomize patients, 10,000 patients randomized with intermediate pretest probability to an anatomic strategy versus a functional strategy. This randomized trial funded by the NHLBI followed patients for 12 months. And at that time, we had 64 slice CTA. This trial called the PROMISE trial that was published in 2015 with the help of Dr. Douglas and others showed the following. These were the types of patients I just described. Ideally, look, 60-year-old patients, 52% of this trial were women, more women than men. 20% or 16% were were um, not white race, and there was hypertension in 65% of patients and diabetes, again, in 22% of patients. These are the types of patients that had, a, at least at that time, a pretest probability of 40 to 50% that you would have said probably could have cardiovascular disease. Interestingly, the rate of invasive cath without obstructive disease was lower, although, interestingly, not as high as shown in the other study. Obviously, people probably picking more carefully, but lower with CTA. And when you looked at revascularization rates, it was actually higher with CTA, including bypass surgery. Twice the number of patients with CTA getting bypass surgery identified, which we would say is a disease that is significant enough to lead to a revascularization benefit. Out to three years, there was no significant difference for death or MI amongst the two groups, although early on there's a separation within a, a catch-up late, again, depending on what kinds of revascularization is going on. Many of you have now heard about the Scott Hart trial. It's worth recognizing the Scott Hart trial. The investigators did sometimes have stress ECGs in some of these patients, but nevertheless, it was a randomized trial of standard of care versus CTA, and now out at five years showing improvement in outcomes in patients getting CTA, obviously in a, in a specific health system in Scotland. But early on, not much separation, but separation over time. And so people said, how do you keep separating with CTA versus standard of care over time? Well, first, the longer-term outcomes may be related to the therapy the patients get. They've identified that those patients at CTA were, again, more adherent to some of the secondary prevention therapies. It does have less radiation than nuclear imaging. So this is the standard of care versus CTA standard of care secondary prevention therapies from 
the newbie New England Journal paper for Scott Hart. Imagine what happens if you have inclycerin or something else you can give the patient where they're really adherent and you know they have atherosclerosis. So back to my patient. Well, she could also have microvascular dysfunction. She may also have areas of blood flow that are normal, but maybe not getting perfect perfusion. So of course, that's where one might argue, in addition to anatomy, we might like physiology. And by now you've heard there are multiple different companies that have done at least assumed FFRCT using computational fluid dynamics to say, what is the prediction of the downstream pressure drop? And in fact, Jim Min and others showed some of these early data where CTA plus an FFR wire, as you've just heard, were compared to show the sensitivity and specificity of that. That went on to now very now in practice clinical protocols where we can use this in our patients and a set of studies that have started to understand how CTFFR works. In fact, if you think about sensitivity and specificity only, it seems to perform pretty well compared to most of the other non-invasive testing. Again, Dr. Douglas and a group of investigators said, what about observationally? How does it work in clinical practice if you put it into a pre-post design? This platform study showed, again, it reduced patients going to the cath lab without obstructive disease. I participated with Jonathan Leipzig and others in where we did a 5,000 patient registry to say, how does FFRCT add to patients getting CT alone? And we identified that it changed management in two thirds of the patients. And when you followed those patients out to a year, those with abnormal CT FFRs, both whether the stenosis was significant or not, did worse than those that had normal CT FFRs. It's another way of looking at the MACE and you can see the gradation across CT FFR. It's important to recognize some of the patients with stenosis don't have an abnormal CTFFR, but also some of the patients with moderate stenosis have an abnormal CTFFR, just like the coronary story, that the angiogram itself is not sufficient. Are we going to get more precise? So this is where we're going. The, the PROMISE group has developed a prediction risk score. Actually, Dr. Rimopali, myself, and Dr. Douglas, and others have this trial called PRECISE that is completed enrollment that takes patients with chest discomfort, 2,100 such patients, and randomizes them to usual care versus a precision-based algorithm in which low-risk patients do not get any test and the higher-risk patients get CT and we follow them for clinical events and cost-effectiveness. Hopefully those data will be out later this year. So back to our guidelines. You saw beautifully presented and a great visual on chest pain evaluation. You see that anybody with the intermediate risks, according to the guidelines, can get a CT or stress test. We're gonna hear the second half of this fun debate on why you might choose the other. It's a class 1A now based on the definitions and the data I've shown you. So I'll conclude by saying the data is evolving for all of these tests. There's much to be learned about how we deliver this. And there's more science coming with the precise trial, as I've said on more importantly, deciding who shouldn't get any tests at all. But getting into practice with procedure planning where we might decide before going to the cath lab what the diagnosis and the burden is, is important. But I think the ischemia trial makes me think one more thing, which is, is it really the burden of athro we care about? Of course we care about stenosis, but the burden of athro probably predicts the most. And how do we activate our patients to present, prevent disease? Showing them that, getting them to take their medications and potentially revascularizing them. I'll finally end the debate with one question. If we had all the data I've shown you on CTA before we had any of the data that we currently have on stress testing, would we assume stress testing is the first line or would we assume CTA is? Thank you. Well, that was, uh, as expected, really superb. Um, I don't know, Dr. Bimalapalli, you have your work cut out for you here, uh, but uh, I know you're up to the task, so go ahead. Um, not easy as well going up against your boss, right? You got to be careful here. don't want to be too nasty in what you do, but, uh, but go yeah, ahead, go for it. So I'll take the other side here. Uh, stress testing, classic um, is the best. Um, and as uh, I was introduced, my name is Sreek Bamilapalli. I'm medical director of the Cardiac Diagnostic Unit at Duke. Here are my disclosures. <clears throat> so what are the goals of a stable chest pain evaluation? I think we could break it down very simply into maybe two things. One would be diagnosis, as, as Deepak uh, mentioned earlier. Is this non-cardiac chest pain? Is this epicardial coronary disease? Is this ANOCA or ischemia with non-obstructive coronary disease? And under that, could it be microvascular dysfunction or perhaps even other cardiac etiologies? And then, of course, beyond diagnosis, we, of course, want to know about prognosis as well. So really, the choice of a stress test should be based on the ability to inform diagnosis and prognosis. Let's start with diagnosis for a second. I think 
Um, you heard from Manesh, our usual way of starting with diagnosis is to think about obstructive coronary disease um, and whether the patient needs a revascularization or a cardiac catheterization or uh, a cabbage of some sort. But uh, Dr. Bott also mentioned in his going over the guidelines that um, things like ANOCA, which again would be ischemia without obstructive coronary disease or with non-obstructive disease, um, is coming into its own. We're recognizing this. So there's three to four million patients within the U.S. alone with this entity. And I'll point out that when Manesh showed you his paper in the New England Journal from 10 years ago, uh, he basically said, look, if you had a positive stress test, but you had a negative cat, that's bad. We, we failed. Uh, well, these three or four million patients fit into that uh, category. It's more prevalent in women than men. And most common causes are thought to be uh, microvascular dysfunction and vasospasm. So I think our usual way of thinking about just um, uh, epicardial coronary disease really misses other cardiac and frankly, coronary causes of chest discomfort. And so I'll point out going back to what uh, Dr. Bott showed in the, in the 2021 guidelines, well, here's the uh, uh, algorithm for ANOCA. And I don't, I don't see CT or CTFFR on this algorithm anywhere. So I guess if we're gonna go with uh, CT or CTFFR first, we don't have a, as good a chance of actually identifying these patients. So just to be clear, invasive coronary function testing is the gold standard, but not done very often. And certainly, uh, at least in the US, many people often uh, default to non-invasive testing. And here, stress PET or stress CMR with a uh, myocardial blood flow reserve um, can help to actually uh, find these patients. But okay, enough with um, uh, Inoka. Why don't we go forward to what everybody's sort of talking about and waiting for, which is epicardial coronary disease. And we'll, we'll uh, take this discussion together with prognosis because I think they're important. So you saw uh, uh, Manesh mentioned the uh, Scott Hart study. It's about 4,000 patients age 18 to 75. That's going to be important. Referred by a PCP to a dedicated chest pain clinic. The 10-year risk of ASCVD by the assigned risk score was 17 plus or minus 12%. Um, and as, uh, as he mentioned, standard of care in this case was mostly exercise treadmill testing. And you can see the curves here on your right, but the take home here is there was a 41% decrease in CV death and MI at five years associated with uh, CTA as a diagnostic test strategy. But really no substantial difference in uh, invasive coronary angiography or revascularization between the two strategies. So how is there this difference in outcomes then? Well, um, you heard it uh, a little bit earlier. Um, there was an increased diagnosis of coronary disease at six weeks, which changed from 1% of patients in usual care uh, up to 27% of patients in uh, CTA. And this was associated, of course, with medication changes. You can see here on the graph, the patients who had CAD by CT across all the uh, risk uh, spectrum of the assigned score had a higher use of uh, antiplatelet and statin therapies at six weeks as compared to those patients who had no CAD by CT. So the thought, the mechanism as you heard earlier is thought to be, well, we're, we're using more uh, appropriate prevention strategies. Uh, and that is what's causing the reduction in, in endpoints. So is that, uh, is that what the take home should be? Well, let's say for a second that that's true, but we'll come back to that uh, in a minute. Well, since the Scott Hart uh, trial, we've had the updated 2018 AHA ACC guidelines for cholesterol management, and then we've had the updated blood pressure management as well. And um, as a gross generalization between these two guidelines, um, the use of preventive therapies, the threshold for use of preventive therapies has been lowered. We know the blood pressure uh, goals have been lowered. We know that there's more emphasis on achieving certain LDL goals um, in, in patients in terms of prevention. So the question I have then is, if it was in fact due to medication uh, use, and now we're using medications more frequently anyway per our guidelines, how do we know that the same effect will be present if we were to repeat the Scott Hart study now um, in, in our current era? But then let's move forward to the PROMISE trial, because I said hold the thought about whether, whether medication uh, uh, increases actually uh, cause a reduction in events. So PROMISE, 10,000 patients without known CAD, median follow-up of just over two years, and here you can see in the primary paper, there was no difference in all-cause death, MI, hospitalization for unstable angina, or procedural complications. 
It did, however, result in more uh, invasive coronary angiography uh, in the CT arm, and we heard um, maybe that's a good thing. But in this case, I would say there doesn't seem to be any difference in outcomes based on doing that. Um, and you might ask, well, what happened with the medicines? Was this somewhat different than Scott Hart? No, in fact, we had the same thing here in, in Promise. CT was associated with an increased uh, diagnosis of non-obstructive coronary disease. And what followed from that was an increased use of certain preventive uh, medications. Yet I just showed you the event rates were the same uh, over the median follow-up time period. So now we have kind of conflicting results between Scott Hart and Promise. Maybe medication changes aren't actually uh, making a difference over the time periods of follow-up uh, that we've looked at. And in addition to that, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the uh, milieu in which these have taken place has changed. We have lower thresholds for using preventive medications. So what else about these two trials uh, becomes important when we think about um, CTA versus stress testing? Well, both Promise and Scott Hart had a substantial number of low risk patients. You can see here uh, on the right using multiple types of uh, risk scores that um, Promise and especially Scott Hart had uh, up to a third of patients who were low risk, but we just heard from Dr. Bott a few minutes ago, perhaps these patients shouldn't be getting any testing at all. So what would the results look like if we had, uh, we had uh, uh, gotten ourselves to only look at intermediate or higher uh, risk patients? So here's a secondary analysis of promise, and this is actually looking at age. And in this setting, I'm gonna use age for just a second as a, um, as a surrogate for risk. So in patients who are older, and this is looking at the primary outcome of CV death and uh, MI, you can see the event rates um, there between positive and negative tests. The panel on the left is a stress test panel, the panel on the right is CT. So if you see on the panel on the left, the patients under 65 for stress testing, positive and negative tests didn't really seem to differentiate the groups very much in terms of their um, prognosis and, and hard outcomes. Whereas in the group over 75, there was a substantial difference in terms of event rate between positive and negative tests. And exactly the opposite is seen here in CT, where the group under 65 seemed to have a bigger difference between positive and negative uh, CT versus the group over 75. So if we're then talking about the group over 75 generally being a higher risk group because of more comorbidities and age, so on and so forth, um, what do we think Scott Hart might have looked like if we took out all of the uh, low risk patients? Could it in fact have looked uh, the other way around? Maybe not because it was exercise treadmill testing there, but again, here in the US population where there was more imaging based stress testing done, it's certainly possible that imaging based stress testing might even look better. And again here, so we look at the event curves again in that same analysis by age, and we can see that um, they seem to separate pretty early within the first several months. And I find that interesting because again, if we go back to this idea that CTA allows us to um, diagnose non-obstructive disease and change medical therapy, and that's the mechanism by which we think in Scott Hart, there's an improvement in outcomes. Well, the, the event curves are separating within a month or two months seems difficult to think that a patient with stable angina with a month of uh, aspirin or a month of statin therapy is going to have this kind of differential in terms of their outcomes. And again, here, just to hammer the point home in terms of age, if you look at the box on the right in red, we can see for in the, uh, the group under 65, those patients who have uh, a positive uh, versus negative stress test, not much of a difference in terms of adjusted outcomes. Whereas CTA, there's a threefold difference. And then looking at the bottom on the right on the table, for those over 75, a positive versus negative stress test, uh, six and a half fold difference, whereas positive versus negative CTA, again, not much difference uh, in terms of uh, outcomes. So you heard uh, uh, Dr. Patel talk about CTFFR, right? We, we have this issue about um, CT being anatomic uh, information only, and perhaps we would do better. Um, if we had uh, physiologic information and maybe reduce the rate of uh, invasive coronary angiography without uh, uh, obstructive disease. And he showed you um, uh, platform and he showed you advanced. And I'll add in a couple of other studies here that have been done as well. Um, and the findings are mostly that, sure, in an observational study, even prospective observational study, it looks like adding CTFFR results in 
canceling more catheterizations, fewer uh, catheterizations with non-obstructive disease. But we have talked about the fact that a catheterization with non-obstructive disease is not necessarily a bad thing to get us down that ANOCA pathway. Um, and so I would summarize this a bit by saying, we really do need some randomized data here, uh, especially um, acknowledging the fact that uh, catheterization with non-obstructive disease isn't always a bad thing. So you've seen this slide before from, uh, from Dr. Patel, but again, just to point out that the ongoing uh, precise trial, uh, which uh, should be um, finishing follow-up here in the next couple of months and hopefully presented later this year, is designed exactly to, um, to test this uh, theory a usual care arm. And then again, I'll just point out on the right-hand side of this diagram, there are patients undergoing a precision evaluation where they will be stratified by the promised risk score. So those patients who are in the lowest decile of risk or lowest um, will, will actually have an upfront um, a strategy of no upfront testing. Um, and those who are in elevated risk will get CTA plus or minus um, FFRCT. You can see here the, the endpoints, which include MACE and then CATH without obstructive coronary disease. So in conclusion, testing and st stable chest pain really has to focus on both diagnosis and prognosis. And CTA is really currently pretty limited relative to CMR or PET in terms of the diagnosis of ANOCA or microvascular dysfunction. CTA is certainly uh, better at diagnosing non-obstructive disease and prompting medication changes, but we've spent some time talking about how it's unclear whether that's actually improving uh, patients' outcomes, at least in the relatively short two to five year uh, time frame that the major uh, randomized trials have followed these patients. Um, and stress testing, perhaps in certain groups, especially in that older, higher risk group, uh, might be superior to CTA in terms of uh, differentiating those patients who are going to have more events. Um, and then of course, CTA is associated uh, with more ICA in almost all studies with the exception of Scott Hart. And we've talked about a little bit whether that's a good or a bad thing. And does the existing CTFFR data really solve the problem there with the more ICA? I would say not. I would say it hints at it, but we haven't really solved it. And that's where the precise trial is going to uh, come in and help us there. Thank you. Okay, I think the all three lecture is a very informative educational lecture. So I, I would like uh, some question to Dr. Uh, Michael Gibson. Uh, you are the very expert in this field. Uh, you know, on nearly the same period, the uh, guideline, two guidelines updated. One is a chest pain guideline. One is the revascularization guideline were updated. Revascularization guideline is absolutely cornerstone. It's a ischemia trial. New chest pain guideline, absolutely cornerstone is a promise trial. Is a, I, I'm wondering how what, what is the think about the, some conflicting part of the two guidelines, also what is uncertainty, you know, to the updated guideline? Could you comment on that? Great. I find it, I find it interesting uh, that we're living in a time where we're seeing two kind of diametrically opposed forces. We're seeing a rise in the entrance in ischemia with no obstructive coronary disease. And we're seeing a rise in the interest of quantitating precisely coronary blockages. And, you know, these are going in opposite directions. You know, it seems like the goal is to turn, cut down on the number of people who have no obstructive disease in the cath lab. We don't want those people to go to the cath lab. That seems like the perception of the interventional cardiologist. I'm one of them. I mean, I can say this. And, you know, we often get people to the cath lab and we say, oh, another false negative, uh, you know, clean corners. But I think we, you know, you know, I've been a big fan of the microvasculature since the 90s. I think we still have a lot of disease in the microvasculature that remains undiagnosed. And so uh, I don't think it's a failing to have people come to the lab and have no epicardial disease. What is a failure? What is a failure is to have women leaving the cath lab without a diagnosis. So we have, we're we're not looking with poor vasospasm in many cases. We're not doing provocative testing. We're not looking at IMR uh, or thermodilution tests. I'd like to see us aggressively pivot over to more aggressive uh, testing using IMR. 
Uh, I now stand, uh, I now say that NCDR stands for now coronary diagnosis required. You can't send people home uh, from the cath lab without doing some interrogation. And I hope we get to a point where we can use some of the things we just talked about, all the CT imaging modalities, et cetera, to maybe do some modeling of uh, IMR. Uh, so we have a lot of women out there, a lot of men, men and women, but a lot of women who are being told they're fine, nothing to worry about, but they do have a poor prognosis, not because of epicardial disease, but because of microvascular disease. So I hope we can shed just as much attention and light on the microvascular sure as the epicardial disease. Okay. Any, any comment on the, this? Yeah, I mean, I, I might make a comment. I, I certainly don't want to belittle, uh, you know, ANOCA is critical and understanding microvascular disease is important. Um, what I think is interesting and important for us to recognize, even some of Harmony Reynolds' work out of ischemia cohort, is that the patients with um, ANOCA, um, they also have atherosclerosis. It just happens to be in the smaller microvasculature, as I know Dr. Gibson's highlighted for many years. So uh, the disease process, at least in 80% of those women that had um, microvascular dis disease without obstructive epicardial stenosis was athro. So, uh, so there's two fundamental questions. One is, um, importantly, ischemia trial, the way it was designed, had a CTA in everybody with an abnormal stress test to ensure that they had some level of obstruction to go for the, you know, the randomized revascularization versus medical therapy. But what I think we're going to learn, and I think we're in the process of that, as, as Dr. Gibson just highlighted, is we need continuous learning on how to better diagnose women, men with not obstructive coronary disease to understand what the problems are. Fundamental, though, is that most of the problem is still athro. And so if you can quantify epicardial or microvascular athro, you're probably going to help those patients. What I would also argue is there are a substantial number of patients that have no athro that have no ischemia or ANOCA, that could likely not be on a statin, that could likely not be on therapies. So today, only in cardiovascular medicine do we say you have some risk factors, everybody gets a therapy. It, it would be akin to in cancer biology to not having a biopsy of the tissue and giving everybody the therapy. It doesn't happen there. So I, I just think we're going to have to get more specific. Great. So you know, to, I, get, to get to okay, that level, you will have to do some population testing, right? Because right now, our testing is reactive. Somebody comes to the emergency room, somebody comes to your office, they complain of chest pain, and then the whole cascade goes down. And really what the debate today is about, what test should we do first? What second? How should we manage these patients? And the bottom line is, you know, I think it... You know, there is some evidence, I think, more towards anatomic um, testing, meaning CT angio, maybe as the first test. But I think to Manesh's point that for on a population basis, why don't we proactively identify patients with certain risk profiles, be it age or some risk factors, and just systematically put them in the scanner? And if we do that, we're going to find, I think, especially in, in this country, in the U.S., and, you know, maybe uh, maybe many other you know, more um, um, advanced uh, countries, there's going to be a lot of disease that is undiagnosed that I think can be uncovered and appropriately mm -hmm. treated uh, medically before it even, you know, becomes symptomatic. Great. So I, I think I, I'd like the, the one question or the moderator and the panel, you know, some Ellen, your intervention cardiologist and the uh, Scott Hart trial shows the absolutely is a dramatic reduction of hard end point uh, of 40% with CT compared to usual care. But listen to publish the discharge trial performed in Germany and compared to intermediate risk uh, patient refer for uh, invasive coronary angio compared to a CT versus uh, uh, the invasive coronary angio. Absolutely no difference. You know, Scott Hart trial is a strong positive trial. Discharge trial is absolutely neutral trial. So how can you interpret the, this as some discordant point? Could you comment any person for discharge trial result and scatter trial result? Is Manish and the Deep Park or the airline? Uh, I'm at least happy to take a stab at that. The first thing I think the reason they're discordant is they're asking different questions. Uh, Doug, uh, and I think that what they're asking is important to recognize in the discharge trial, 
it was CT before cath. That didn't mean they didn't have other stress testing. So you are taking a population of patients who have an abnormal. So that's a strategy in which you're saying, does a CT before a cath reduce clinical events. And depending on how many patients you do and how many things you look at, you didn't, you know, it was powered to show reduced clinical events with CTA and didn't show it, it showed similar events. But there were still some more complications, even with the diagnostic cath, even at a low rate, there was a little bit more vascular complications. And of course there's a cost and there's the duplication of testing. So I think the question that Scott Hart was trying to get to was better strategy of diagnosing. Although again, there, there were some patients who did have a treadmill test and remember in Scotland, those are patients who are waiting, a, let's say, some period of time to get to a cath lab. So randomizing to a CTA strategy might be beneficial if you identify those patients that are, I'll call them hotter and closer to having needing revascularization or needing care, you might show a benefit, although I recognize revascularization rates were somewhat similar. So I just think they were asking different questions. So if you do CT in front of cath, it becomes hard to show that CT is dramatically better because some of those patients, many of those patients still need a cath especially if you enrich the population. And I think ultimately the prognosis of, of these patients is really determined by their atherosclerotic burden, right? Obviously, the more disease they have, the higher the risk. And, I, and whether you do, um, you know, stress testing, a functional study, at the end of the day, that's what's showing up in a functional study also, that these are patients with multivessel disease that predominantly have abnormal scans. And I think those patients obviously at higher risk. And at the end of the day, whether you identify them by the by a, a nuclear study, by a CT or or invasive, um, you know, cardiac catheterization, it, it doesn't really matter. The, the important thing is to identify these patients and treat them aggressively. Okay. But while we're focusing on extent of disease, we also need to understand the activity of the disease. You know, more than just how tight the lesion is, what's its, you know, plaque constitution and how high of a risk is it for plaque rupture? Uh, so, you know, I think we need to move beyond just how tight it is to also how active it is and how risky it is. And of course, that's, you know, that's an active area of investigation, right? Plaque characteristics and, and, and rupture uh, risk. And, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, sold CT short a little bit in terms of what the areas of active investigation are. Certainly, um, you know, we talked about precise, but also uh, thinking about um, uh, evaluating um, uh, for ANOCA with uh, perfusion, with CT perfusion testing, right? That's being developed as well. So, I mean, this is something kind of to check back in shortly on uh, to see how that plays out. Yeah, I think if we also had um, if we also had markers, you know, injectable markers to characterize the plaque on CT as well as perfusion, then we're getting everything. We're getting plaque constituency, we're getting the stenosis severity, and we're getting the microvasculature. I think I hope that's where we're going to end up someday. Yeah. yeah, I think eventually we will have that sort of one-stop shopping where you get all the information you want, anatomic, physiologic situation in the epicardial arteries, the situation in the microvasculature, additionally, the myocardium, you know, how is it functioning? So I, I think eventually we will get there. Yeah, just to uh, add on to something Manesh said earlier, I think that um, I'm not a, a sort of nuclear cardiologist, but uh, they would argue that some of the plaque characteristic um, work is actually being done with kind of um, nuclear tagged antibodies in, in, in on top of CT imaging. So it's kind right. of imaging would be another way to get at that comprehensive uh, look. So the, I, I think based on the uh, based on the ischemia trial uh, treatment uh, perspective, the ischemia trial the exclude the patient with the low ejection fraction and left main disease based on the CT. So the and other pa or other or patient uh, the regardless of revascularization or not, no survival difference. So. Based on the such data, uh, I, I, I think, uh, do we really need the other stress test in patient complained? Uh, I'm not sure, uh, complained the uh, stable chest pain, I think. So in my, uh, in my outpatient clinic, I try to check the ejection fraction and CT to rule out the significant left main disease. I think two, two tests would be the most important factor to decide the uh, patient future treatment strategy, I think. Mm 
I didn't play a role in the ischemia trial, but uh, I, I I do wish potentially just to, I know it was hard, but uh, I do wish we would have been able to enroll patients without excluding the left main patients. I think it would have added to the opportunity to show a difference potentially and would have added to a strategic question of which you should do for patients with just without knowing their anatomy, if you will, if it was blended, just a, just a strategy to ensure that the people had coronary disease, but left main is, it's really hard to, you know, I can imagine ethics committees not wanting people with left main disease and randomized into a medical therapy. And I might add like, you know, the idea of saying um, we're going to use CT to rule out left main disease, I, I think that makes complete sense, but it's also predicated on the idea that two things. One, you think you might miss left main disease, you get a false negative stress test, functional test, or two, that if you get a positive functional test, you somehow are trying to avoid the cath lab, um, right? So I, I'm not sure that either of those are often true, right? And we've talked about Anoka and maybe not necessarily wanting to avoid the cath lab. Um, so I think those are just two two things to consider. Okay, Toyun, any comment? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I also, I am a big fan of the city because it is very critical to identify the Korean atherosclerosis. And because we have a strong weapon statin and we can help the patient with atherosclerosis, even if the patient does not have obstructive CAD. And furthermore, in clinical practice, ruling out the patient with no non-obstructive CAD with the CT is extremely helpful to assure the patient. So uh, I want to just ask the practical questions to the expert panelists and moderators that in your daily practice, which do you prefer in now? For me, I pref I'm, I'm using CT more and more nowadays. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a great question that you've posed and the way you've posed it. And I think the reality is, you know, people will speak with their feet. That is, I think CT angio is going to increase dramatically in years to come. I think in part, it's for the reason you cited the ability to say, oh, this patient with chest pain doesn't have coronary artery disease. Next time they come back in three months from now, you don't have to go through the same algorithm over and over. So I, I think in part, but I also think because patients like it, I mean, they like knowing whether they do or don't have coronary artery disease. Uh, sometimes they even like seeing the pictures. So especially in the stable coronary artery disease patient, I think increasingly patients are going to demand, you know, CT angios, whether they need one or not, or whether the data is supported or not is a separate issue, especially, you know, as the cost comes down, as the radiation exposure comes down. So, you know, I, I envision a future where CT angiography as even a screening test for coronary artery disease becomes very common. I'm not saying that's evidence-based. I'm not saying that's in the guidelines or will ever be in the guidelines, uh, but I think it's a sort of like wearables, right? I mean, we can debate whether picking up AFib on a wearable is a good thing or a bad thing, but you know, patients are, or not even patients, healthy people are just gonna be doing that increasingly as the technology becomes more accessible and cheaper and more reliable. So I, I think that CT is, is not only here to stay, it'll become the dominant mode of assessing coronary artery disease. Well, we can reassure them they don't have epicardial coronary artery disease, but we cannot assure them that they don't have microvascular disease. And um, again, I, I think, I hope we'll get to a point where we can have some non-invasive means to test that. So is I have a one the question, Dr. Three Kans, and you are showing the stress testing part. And so uh, a couple of weeks ago, we invited some lecture, debate lectures. So one part is a radiologist and the CT prefer, and the one part is a nuclear imaging specialist. They are debate some proposed age threshold, 65. There was some based on, uh, you know, promise trial, the, the uh, subgroup analysis, uh, JAMA cardiology. And uh, you know, the CT specialist the pre, the emphasize we can do every age the CT scanning, also nuclear imaging specialist. We can do all age group and the nuclear scanning. How do you th think about the 65 age threshold uh, in the, you know, widely applicable in routine real practice? How do you think about that? Yeah, so... Um... I would say that that um, kind of comment is 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 pretty typical, and I, Manesh um, alluded to this at one point in his talk, where he, he thought I was going to show a bunch of sensitivities and specificities, and many of those are based on observational data, single center, or across multiple types of prevalence and ages, and so it's that kind of data plus kind of the the, the practical experience of saying yes, I can administer. 
a, a nuclear spec to somebody of any age safely and, and, and get a picture that I believe in. Um, but but I, I specifically did not show that kind of data because I wanted to step back and say, you know, Manesh is right. Like the advent of CT has taken us to a place where the bar for data here has gone up as it should appropriately. And so again, the, the, the slides that I showed in terms of, of age and, and the secondary analyses out of promise, you know, really would suggest that there is a difference by age and perhaps that's mediated by risk factors and, and prevalence of disease or pretest probability. So I don't agree with, with those comments that, hey, CT is, is always good. It's always the right test. It's, you know, you should never order anything else. I think we heard Deepak say this before in more nuanced terms, like every patient is individual and you'll have to make a decision based mm -hmm. on that. We haven't even talked about things like high calcium scores and how that might affect a CT or the very obese patient, how that might affect a, a SPECT, um, you know, so there's many layers of nuance to this. Great. So I think the time is already done. I would like to uh, ask a summary and closing remark, Dr. Deepak Bhatt, for this session. Well, first of all, I'd say thank you for organizing this uh, session, Dr. Park. I think it was uh, really interesting, at least for me, hopefully, for your audience as well. I learned a lot from the other panelists, really great lectures, great discussion. I think it shows the uh, complexity and subtleties involved with assessing chest pain. There's no quick, easy answer. I mean, it, it's sort of easy in a debate to just pick one side and you know, sort of uh, run with it. But I, I think as both our debaters here very nicely did, they showed there's a lot of um, in between here, as is true of all of clinical medicine. It's rarely just black and white. It's mostly living in the world of gray. Uh, so hopefully um, this discussion will help those in the audience really tackle chest pain in a more guideline-based way uh, and in a more thoughtful way. So I'd like to thank the panelists and uh, really uh, just say thank you, Dr. Park, for organizing this wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate thank you. I hope care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. All the best. Bye. Thank you.